Okay, so this topic is on basic map making using ArcGIS and, and specifically ArcMap within within GIS. So some, some goals for this presentation. We want to look at the basics of creating a map in ArcGIS and some things that you should know by the end of this lecture and discussion. You should know about the different types of maps we make. There's two big classes of, of maps. They're either general reference or they're thematic maps. Uh, we'll also look at many different considerations for making a map, things like the format of the map, the layout, the purpose of the map, and the overall design. These are all things we have to think about when we, uh, when we make a map. We'll look at different map elements, things like titles and scales, legends, how all of these things get added to maps. So we get we have a lot of stuff on maps outside of the actual map content. We have descriptive text, um, sources of data, uh, neat lines, other graphics, logos, all kinds of things that go on maps in addition to the actual map data. Um, we'll also want to get familiar with the difference between two ways that we view data in ArcMap. There's the data view and there's the layout view. So uh, this is kind of like paper space and model space in the CAD world. Um, so we'll look at data view and layout view and the differences in those and why you might work in one versus the other. And we'll, we'll be able to create a basic map using ArcGIS. So these two different kind of maps, uh, general reference and thematic maps. So general, refer map, general reference maps are maps that contain a variety of information and they're often used for many different purposes it's kind of general use and general purposes so maps that have a lot of information about a lot of things this is an example of like a, a road atlas or a state transportation map but you see there's a lot of information on it you can see county labels and road labels and streams and rivers and state parks and uh, lakes all kinds of different information on this map so these kind of maps are usually things like road and street maps, political maps, or topological maps, like, or, or topographic maps, or topological like uh, USGS topo maps, or general reference maps. They don't have one specific purpose. They're more used for, for general reference, finding your way around. These maps tend to focus on, on the base layer, and they highlight all kinds of different stuff. So these kind of maps, we say they, they focus on place, right? The other kind are thematic maps. Thematic maps focus more on the distribution of a single kind of phenomena or attribute within your data. So they show a topic or issue connected to a geographic area, and the purpose is to communicate information about that location. So whereas we say those, uh, we focus the uh, General reference maps focus more on place. We say these focus more on space. Um, these kind of maps are going to have some general reference information on them, just so literally you know where in the world you are. Like this map shows um, these different geographic areas where they measure drought, but it also shows the state boundaries on the map. So the geographic areas where they measure drought they are they're showing an, a variable of the severity of drought across the United States so this map really focuses more on drought than the general location of rivers and cities and states and counties and, and all these other kind of things out there in the world so they focus more on a specific topic or theme they focus on a single attribute within a layer often this is kind of a third class of maps. Um, the third class of maps that is, is relatively new compared to how long I've been talking about the types of maps are, are interactive maps. These are maps that are designed to respond to user input. They're often found on websites. Right? So interactive maps are more internet maps. Maps that you can click on and get information. You can zoom in and out. You can pan. You can turn layers on and off yourself. These kind of maps give everyone the ability to use a GIS-like map, but oftentimes people still don't really understand what they're looking at and, and what they're using, how they should be using the data. 
So interactive maps have put cartography and GIS work, basic types of GIS work, in the hands of everyone. Um, it's, it's made it available to, to the world. So that's good because it used to be such a highly specialized thing that only the GIS people had the maps and even used the maps. Now at least the data and information can more easily get out in the hands of people, but it, it's also more easily misused because of that. Right? So you can see this map has an aerial photograph. It's got some floodplain information on it. There's some kind of grids as, as well. <coughs> this, data, this data I know is actually collected in those, those grids that you see. Um, you see there's some other information on this map. Is it a general reference or a thematic map? I mean, it really focuses a lot on the floodplain information, so it's kind of thematic in that nature, but it's got some other general inf reference information on it. Having that aerial photograph in the back is, 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 uh, is another uh, layer that, that gives you more information. So let's uh, give a quick ba look back up at these other two maps and just talk about some of the other things on them while we, while we scroll through. I wanted to make a point that every, all maps are they're different. Okay, they all have different information on them. They all serve different purposes. Maps like these, if you look at them, there's a ton of information on this general reference map. There, the amount of text that goes on a map like this is extraordinary. It's, it's a lot of information, the type that's put on the map. So getting type placed on a map like that is time consuming. There's a lot of automated processes to label features. But to make it look that good, without things overlapping, without the labels obscuring everything else, labeling a map and getting the text on it placed well can be challenging. Okay? That's a lot of information. The more information you put on a map, the harder it is for the map to, to relay the message you're trying to give someone. Okay? So the bigger topic of today uh, would, would be cartography. So cartography is the art and science of making maps. And with maps, you are trying to convey scientific-based information to an audience. And you want to do it in a way that your message is clear and it doesn't confuse the people who are, who are looking at the map. Something like this map is not necessarily a, a, some kind of scientific um, project going on. This is just information about a certain geographic area, but at the same time, it, it's hard to convey this much information without making a map confusing and, and hard to read. This map doesn't have any labels on it. Okay? So labels are, are something you'll see on most maps. This map really uses a legend. So a legend helps you to understand the symbols on the map and what they mean. We'll talk about a legend um, more in a few slides, but I just wanted to point out the difference in, in some of the amount of information on a map too. This literally has two layers, or two layers. There's one layer of, of the drought conditions based on these odd shaped polygons, like that middle one in South, see how these polygons are kind of oddly shaped in there within the state of South Carolina and North Carolina. They're based on, um, I'm not sure what they're based on. I would think they would be based on something to do with uh, uh, like watershed areas as well. You know, probably where drainage is, probably, I guess. But the point is that's one layer on this map, and the other layer is the state boundaries. So there's two layers of, of information on this map, and nothing is labeled. Compared to this map, it probably has 12 layers on it plus a lot of uh, text, so, um, and that's just a guess, but there's a lot more information on this map. And then you have this map. With interactive maps, the user has control to turn things on and off. Oftentimes, this map, maybe not, but interactive maps, sometimes the user can turn layers on and off. Labels are more dynamic in a, in a interactive digital setting. You can, as you change scales, you can tell the software to turn more labels on. So when you're zoomed out real far, maybe you don't see many labels, but as you zoom in, maybe the, the road labels will turn on. Other layers can turn on and off. So interactive maps 
give just that, more interaction by the user. You know, in the GIS, and within ArcMap, when we're working with and making a map, our map's interactive like this web map. We can add layers, turn layers on and off, we can label things, we can, we can do different things. Okay, so what should you consider when you're making a map? When you're making the map, when you are making a map, the main goal should be to make a map that is meaningful to your audience. Anytime someone contacts me about making a map, that's the first thing I try to get out of them. What, who, who's the map for? Okay, is it for a, uh, a scientist that knows a ton about the topic? Or is it a hiking map for a retirement community where the, there's going to be some elderly people hiking out on trails? I mean, those are two very different audiences for two very different types of maps. But you want to be thinking about that right off the bat. And I've, I've done both of those things recently in the past year or two. So maps are a form of visual communication. Right? So we're visually communicating with maps. We're trying to relay a message, communicate data and information to an audience. Good maps share similarities with, with good papers. So you've probably all had a class that talked about how to write a good paper, how to, how to write a research paper, how to how to research a topic and put it in a, in a well-formatted uh, paper. Things like having a solid topic, being well-organized, you want to contain factual information, you want to be concise and to the point. You don't want to have information on the map that is not related to the topic. You want to focus the viewer's attention to what is most important. So what's most important about your map? You want to make sure that that stands out. And you want to be persuasive. You want to sell your, your topic, what you're trying to convey to someone. So those are, those are all considerations for making a, making a good map. So who is your audience? There's, we usually think of audience as being in one of two kind of buckets. We've got people who don't know a lot about the topic. They are non-experts, you know, people like the general public. If you're trying to give someone information who doesn't know a lot about the topic, you want to keep um, more common terms, keep the language suitable for the public. You want to have some supporting text, and legends, and it, for, for really complex topics, things that people aren't going to understand a lot about. You want to try to, to uh, provide supporting information to help them understand. But minimize the extra kind of stuff that distracts from the main purpose. Right? Keep it focused on the main topic. So uh, the opposite of that is a subject matter expert. If I go to make a map about beach erosion, but it's going to be for a geologist, I'll probably want to include more information about why the beach erosion is there, because the geologist is probably trying to, to mitigate the problem. That's different than if I'm making a map for about beach erosion to a bunch of retirees who have $3 million homes close to the beach erosion. They're, they want to know how close it is to their house and, and not necessarily as much real scientific information about it. Um, another good example of, of having different audiences, uh, last year when the Party Rock fire was going on in Bat Cave, do you all remember that? It was a big fire down there. Um, we were, uh, that semester we were, mapping it as it was happening happening there's a website you can download daily data from all the forest fires on the in the country um, so updated boundaries fire boundaries go up daily and where they're cutting in lines and all kinds of stuff so um, I had a student who was also down there working on that fire and their GIS command center they were making maps for the public so to put in like gas stores and to take to, pu to, to local meetings with people are in the meetings or making some maps like that. And those maps had more general information on where the fire is, maybe where roads are closed to the public, um, maybe where there's evacuation centers if you need to go, things like that for the public. But then they were also making this other set of maps for the people fighting the fire. So the people fighting the fire needed to know where they were cutting in fire lines every day, where the water sources were outside. They were even putting things like the, the prevailing wind patterns for the day on the maps and things like that. So two really different audiences. 
for the same uh, mapping the sa mapping the same um, thing that's in occurring out there in the real world, um, but they were they were making very different maps for that. Um, you also want to think about how much time people have to look at maps. I make a map once a year that shows uh, the uh, the enrollment from zip codes in Western North Carolina that come here to, uh, to and they present it at the Board of Trustees meeting here once a year. They, they ask me to make the map, so they dump me the data with student names by z or student numbers by zip code, and I connect that table to a uh, to a zip code polygon layer, and I symbolize it light to dark colors. The light colors have less students than the dark colors. They, I make the map really simple. Um, it's not the 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 uh, the people looking at it are there are board of trustees and our president, and and it's not that they don't know a lot about students and why students come here and they don't have interest in it, but they're they want the they want to know and they want to know quick. They want a good visual. They don't want to spend a ton of time looking at it. They don't want to compare year to year. They they want pretty simple information on it. Um, another good example are these maps right here, an evacuation map. If your building's on fire and you look at the evacuation map, you want it to be pretty clear, right? You want it to not have a bunch of extra information on it. You want it to show you where to go. You don't want to have to read a paragraph that tells you that the green star on one side means this and the black X on another side, you know, you, you want it to, you want it to speak to you as quickly. You want information just to like jump off the map at you. All right, so, um, so another example of, of maps being made for people in, in hurries, you'd also want it to be simple and to the point. All right, how about the format of your map? Is it gonna be a printed paper map or is it going to be a digital map for something like web media? So if it's going to be a printed map, you want to know the page size right off the bat. Right after I ask what, who, who the map's for, who's going to be using this map? What's it for? I say, well, how do you, are we talking about a paper map? Are we talking about a map for your phone? Are we talking about a, something for your, your internet site? Right? Usually they say, oh, yeah. Usually, usually you say, do you want a paper map or an internet map or one for your phone? They say, yeah, that'd be great. No, wait, wait, which do you want? Yeah, we want them all. Those are, the data that you build is all used in those maps, but the maps are different, different products that are built differently and uh, even at different scales in a paper map. Um, a lot of the things take, it, it's not as simple as just stretching the map up from small to big, small to big on a, on, for a paper map. So. Um, the page size, find that out immediately. The scale of the map is really important to establish early on. The scale of your map is really dictated by the size piece of paper you're mapping on and the size geographic area that you're mapping. Right? So I made a map of Ridgecrest Conference Center last semester, and they wanted it on an 8.5 by 11 piece of paper, period. All right, and Ridgecrest is the size Ridgecrest is. So if you want to include the entire Ridgecrest boundary on an eight and a half by 11 piece of map, your scale is defined by the fact that Ridgecrest has a boundary and your eight and a half and 11 is a certain size, right? And so we started off at that and they're like, wow, that's pretty zoomed out. We don't get the detail. They wanted the trail system. And then Montreat is adjacent to it. so. Like, you know, we'd like a little bit of Montreat. And so trying to decide the zoom extent of that map within an 8.5 by 11, we ended up not including all of, of Ridgecrest. We zoomed in on it. But every time you zoom, the scale changes. The more you zoom in, the more detail you can put on it. It's going to be a, a, a map of their trails, a hiking map, right? So they wanted a good bit of detail. Um, but coming to... Deciding on that final scale before you do a ton of your your labeling and symbology work is really important. You don't want to change the scale of your map 80% through the project, or you'll have to redo all of your labels and a lot of a lot of things you will have to redo. So scale is really important. Scale is something that's really hard to get people to understand the 
uh, the subtle differences scale makes. Hard to get people to commit to scales. Um, I'll show you um, another map as well in a little bit on, on scale and tell you uh, about the scale of it. Um, all right, so are you going to use grayscale or color? Ridgecrest wanted to print all these things in-house as cheap as they could, um, so they wanted a black and white map. Designing for a black and white map is very different than designing a color map. It's also another consideration. People often will you'll, uh, design a map, and they will make black and white copies of it and hand out to people. And colors don't look the same when they get converted to grayscale. So what you're trying to represent will not be there if it's converted to grayscale. Or it will be symbols will look the same that look different in color. So there's ways to design in black and white, but designing a black and white map is different than designing a color map. You don't want to design a color map and just have them convert it to black and white. All right, with, uh, with, web, with the web media, is it a fixed image or interactive? I did, they do have that web map on, they do have that map on their website. Um, so it's just a PDF, a static PDF on their website. Um, do you, you want to have different uh, scales? Do you need a user interface? Performance and technology uh, considerations are all things to think about with, uh, with web media and um, more digital type delivery of maps. People will almost always want to take the map you designed for paper and just put it on their website. And sometimes that works okay and sometimes it, it doesn't work as well. Um, maps look different when they're displayed if you design it to print it. Color comes out different on a printer than color is represented on a monitor. Colors are built differently in print and digital, uh, so the, you'll get color differences as well. So you, you really have to consider all of those things when you're when you're making maps. All right. So what goes on a map? Now some kind of covered up letters and and topics here. The map itself we refer to as the data frame, especially in ArcGIS. Maps can have multiple data frames. Many of them do. This has a data frame here that contains some information about a fire in California. And this data frame is a locator map that shows where that fire um, occurred. You've got a legend here that describes what these colors mean. And this was years, whoops, this was years that this area burned, okay? The yellow burned first and has burned out all the way through the dark red. Okay. So this legend helps you understand things on the map that you wouldn't understand otherwise as far as what the, they mean. It's also got a title, Fire History in Topanga, California. There's a scale bar, some indication of scale. There's a north arrow, we'll talk about in a minute. And we also have some other citation, data, data um, credits, maybe a title, or not a title, maybe an author, a date. Dates are always really nice to put on maps. You should almost, you should, you should always put a date on a paper map. I can't tell you how many times I've grabbed a paper map and I'm looking and I'm like, well, when, when, when was this made? I've got a map from Pisgah National Forest from 1990? I think it is in my office, 1990. It was a lot different then, um, but it, th there's a date on that. I was looking at it the other day, and I was like, well, how old is this map? And uh, if there wasn't a date, it, it would be hard to trust anything on it. Now, it, in 1990, you might not trust anything anyway, but um, it's good to know. All right, so north arrows, uh, most people put north arrows on a map. You can rotate your data frame so that north is not up. By default, in the ArcGIS world, <coughs> and, and in GIS, and most GIS software that I know of, north is up by default. You often see maps that surveyors make in AutoCAD. Surveyors will rotate properties they're mapping all kinds of directions to make them fit on pages as well. We do some too, but in the GIS world, you see north up a lot more. 
a lot of maps, again, by surveyors, I see are not Northrop. And I make some maps that are not Northrop, but, but normally they are. If North is not up, you definitely need a North arrow on there. Okay? The one argument when you wouldn't need it is when it's got a rectangular grid on it that indicates North is up already. You see a grid on it. That's the argument some people make. I put North arrows on all of my maps. On some maps, North is not the same direction all the time. North change is magnetic North compared to true North. So magnetic North kind of changes. It does kind of change. It does it changes a lot on maps. It's in big areas where where it's not in a, a rectangular coordinate system kind of kind of thing. So so those are all considerations. I put North arrows on my map. Some more about the map anatomy, some other things, insets or locator maps. We talked a little bit about that. Supporting text, graphics, charts, and images, reference systems such as a graticule or a grid. You can see latitude and longitude displayed on this map up here. We'll talk about graticules and grids. Next class, I think. Date and copyright information. Technical details such as the projection and coordinate system information, neat lines. Okay, so all kinds of, you see a lot of different information on maps. Um, and this map is about uh, uh, volcanoes and earthquakes around the Pacific Rim. Um, it's, it shows the magnitude of earthquakes. The, the bigger yellow ones are, are the bigger magnitudes. And the smaller brownish ones or, or burgundy or the, the less we, you want to play on how people just kind of automatically interpret things when they look at maps, and people think of smaller as less and bigger as more. So mapping the earthquakes by their magnitude, it it jumps out at you that the bigger bright ones are are the biggest ones, and the smaller little ones are the small ones. You can, you you, that's what you think just just glancing at it. Okay, so we put a lot of information on a map. And sometimes the amount of information, you, you need more information to explain a complex topic. Sometimes you've just got this big awkward white space in the middle of your map that you want to balance it out. So you might put some more information about the topic there, even though it might be cursory kind of information. Not It, it would be about the topic, but not um, really important to understanding the main topic. All right, so a legend. Arc map will insert a legend based on the, the layers you have turned on and symbolized in your map. The legend tells the map reader the meaning of the symbols used to represent features on the map. They're especially important when the map symbols are general in nature and not intuitive. Okay, so if I've got a map of a neighborhood that shows you know, 30 houses, it's a very large scale map showing a small area in a lot of detail and this neighborhood has eight fire hydrants in it maybe so I make those fire hydrants look like fire hydrants on the map I might not put that in a legend it's a fire hydrant it look it's got a symbol that looks like a fire hydrant okay if I'm making a map of all of Buncombe County on a big 40 by 40 piece of paper, and I want to show the 3,000 manholes we have. I do them as a little red dot on the map, a little simple red circle. I'll probably put that in the legend so people can say, oh, what are all these red dots? Unless the title says Map of Fire Hydrants, but I probably would include it anyway. It's most important when you look at a symbol on a map and you can't, you don't know what it is other than looking at a legend. A lot of times symbols are um, are intuitive. Okay. I will I will oftentimes leave off the blue squiggly line that represents a river on my maps. I don't put river in my legend with a with a river, and you'll see that on a lot of maps. But I think it's pretty obvious what they are on on my maps, and a lot of times I leave them off if, I'm, if I don't have a lot of space. It's a decision based on trying to fit everything in. All right, 
know. So we'll look at how to insert a legend and include and exclude things in legends as well. All right. Data view versus layout view. We uh we look at our data in two different ways in ArcMap. Data view is used for working with the data, organizing your layers, getting your symbology going, working with labels. You only see one data frame at a time. Map elements, things like your north arrow and your title, they're not visible in data view. In layout view, you're working in your page view. You can see the actual page you're mapping on. It's like your virtual paper. You can see all the other map elements as well. You can arrange map elements on the page, and you can see multiple data frames at each time on your page. Things like editing, we used to always do in data view. To be perfectly honest, we used to do a lot more stuff in data view. These days, in later versions of ArcGIS, when you're within layout view, you can do what's called focus your data frame. And it makes your data frame act a lot like more like you could like it does when you're in data view. And I will I'll demonstrate that when we get to it. One example of some things you couldn't do in one but could do in the other. You used not to be able to, during an edit session, delete features if you were in layout view. You, you couldn't be editing your data and delete features. So we were constantly switching back to data view. Okay. Um, now we can focus our data frame. We can do some of those things. Why do you want to do it in layout view? Switching back between the two does weird things to scale. Hey, I, I told you how important scale was. If when you establish your scale, that, that scale is established in the layout view on your page, deciding on how big your data frame is going to fit on the page and how much you're going to be zoomed in on the data. So when you start labeling and everything, it looks like it should look at scale in layout view. When you switch over to data view, data view doesn't have this page size concept. And so the scale gets a little wonky and things don't look as good. Symbols don't look as good. Labels don't look as good. It's nice to stay in layout view and, and uh, focus your data frame and do the kind of things you would. Nor we used to have to switch back to data view for. All right. So here's data view with the add data button. You can toggle between data view and layout view down here. Your data frame. You'll see your coordinate units down here. I look down there a lot to, to keep up what, what coordinates I'm using. Here's our table of contents with our layers organized. We've got what's called our standard toolbar that lets us zoom in and out on the data, zoom to the full extent, select features, identify, measure, find. We can open the catalog window here can add data. When we switch to layout view, you'll see your virtual page here. We get another toolbar called the layout toolbar. Make sure you notice it and compare how it looks to your standard toolbar here. They both have this zoom and zoom out magnifying glass thing. They look similar, but this represents a page. So whereas you're zooming in and out on the data, using the standard toolbar, meaning you're changing the scale when you zoom in and out with these. When you zoom with these, you're simply moving in and out on the page, not changing the scale of the data. You might want to zoom in down here to read this uh, credit, but it doesn't change the scale of the data. It zooms in on the page. So here's your page layout. You also get some layout rulers that you can put guides and do snapping and all kinds of stuff. And this is where you would insert your title, your legend, scale bar, north arrow. Okay. So people get confused on these toolbars. You're in the layout view, and you want to just zoom in on the page, but you zoom using this one, and it, it zooms in real tight on the data within the data frame. So think of the layout 
toolbar as being to zoom in and out on that virtual page. It's not available in data view. It's grayed out. In layout view, you have access to both toolbars. All right. Okay. We insert map elements from the insert dropdown. When you are in layout view, you can insert all kinds of map elements, legend, north arrow, scale bar, scale text. If you try to insert these, and this a lot of this is grayed out, you're in data view. You can't insert these in data view. So if you see them grayed out, you need to switch to layout view. You can also insert other elements on the maps. You can draw things on the map squares, lines, leader lines. You can even type text right on the map. Usually our text gets on the map by labeling features based on the attributes in the table. You can automatically label a bunch of features because they have this database information that describe. Usually we automatically label things, but if you were making a quick map and you had two points on the map and you wanted to label them is where you saw some invasive species. I was helping someone at the Appalachian Trail Conservancy last week make a map and he had literally two places he'd seen invasive species on the AT. So the AT goes across the map and these two things and, and I said well, well let's label them and he said well there's nothing in the database. I didn't build, I just took two points of the GPS. I can tell you what this one is and what that one is but it's not in the database. I said okay well let's just grab your draw toolbar click this A right here and we can just type right on the map what those two are. It was a really simple map. He needed it quickly. The database wasn't built for it. So, so we just threw the text on the map. All right. Normally we work hard to build our database in a way that you could then put those points in another map and label them by the database information. It makes the data more useful for, um, over time. So, um, so when you're in data view, this draw toolbar works kind of different depending on where you use it and how you use it. If you're in data view, the draw toolbar is, at, is used to add elements to the data frame so that they are treated like data. Meaning if you pan and zoom, whatever you put on the map pans and zooms with the map. Okay. If you're in layout view, if the data, you have to focus the data frame when you use the draw toolbar if you want it to move with the map. If the data frame isn't focused and you put it in in layout view and you put a piece of text that says whatever kind of invasive species that was by the point, if he pans the map, the text doesn't move with it. So you gotta be careful using that draw toolbar because in data view and in layout view with the data frame focused, it moves with the data if the data moves. All right, so building a great map how to do it here's some steps consider the map purpose and audience think and plan the data you'll need to communicate to your audience collect your data open arc map you'll be in data view by default and the first thing you want to do is to set your page and print layout settings you want to put in the page size all right the default is based on the print your default printer on your computer. So every one of you, the default is going to be eight and a half by eleven. All right. The default in a lab like this, I could make that plotter back there my default printer on this computer, and so it would automatically go to a big page. All right. So if you know you're designing for a big page, you have to go in there and change the page size to what you're going to be mapping. And some of it you have to. You don't a lot of you have to go in there just to figure that out even you know, to try different things. I mean, I, I, I will oftentimes give people a bunch of different options. You know, here's what it looks like on a 20 by 30 piece of paper. It works out to this scale. If you want a more detailed scale, we have to go to a bigger piece of paper. You know, sometimes you have um, technical constraints. If you don't have a plotter, you can't print to a big piece of paper unless you want to pay Kinko's to do it, right? So you got to think about your, your technical constraints as well. You want to decide, decide on your page size, okay? What you don't want to do uh, in a class, it's happened several times. I've told students, you know, this is your assignment. You're going to 
make a map on a 40 by 40 piece of paper. You're going to map Buncombe County. You're going to put the parks on it or the greenways or, or whatever I ask them to put on it. And after like four classes, I find someone who's working on, they put Buncombe County in, they put the data in, they're putting their layout, they're doing all this stuff. And I look and they never change their page size. They're working on a little eight and a half by 11. And so they have to change the page size and then stretch the data frame and then all cha it, cha it, it tweaks everything. So you don't want to do that. You want to get, you want to know your page size and your, your general geographic extent as early on as you can find out. And some of the time, you know, it's the first part of a project, you might be doing a couple of different ones to figure out what works, but um, you want to, you want to, uh, get that determined early early on all right so once you decide your your page size and your scale are really determined together um, prepare your data add it to the map if you have to perform any kind of analysis you do um, add data more data I guess add adding your data um, adjust the the drawing order of your data so that the most important layers are on top and stand out, aren't, aren't covered up by other polygons. Choose appropriate symbology. You gotta go pick your colors and your symbols and all that stuff. You switch to layout view and you arrange the data frame on the page as efficiently as you can. You add supporting elements, print or export, export your data. Make sure and save often all the way through. Some useful tips. Always store relative paths with your geodata with your map documents. Map documents reference data on a computer. And so a map document, a .mxd, is no good without the data that it goes with. What a relative path does is stores, stores the information that is in, stores the data that's in a map document, stores that location where it is, the path to where it is, in a relative manner so it doesn't matter if the drive letter changes for that data. So when you, it makes map documents portable and I'll demonstrate that as well. You also want to change your default geodatabase. When you go to perform operations in your map, in your map documents, in ArcMap, that create new data, the data has to have a place to go. Right? Usually you have a geodatabase for each project. So when you're working in a map and you do something that's going to create some new data, if you've set your project database to the default database, it automatically goes to that database. It's set to go somewhere else by default. So there's a, ge there's a geodatabase that's named default.gdb. And it's in your username, documents, ArcGIS folder. So if you aren't careful, things output to that database. Or you have to change it every time and tell it to go to your project database. So setting your default geodatabase saves time. It, 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 it makes your workflow better. Bookmarks allow you to zoom back to a previous extent. Bookmarks bookmark a geographic extent. So when you come up with the extent of your data and the scale of your data, you can bookmark it. So you can always get back to it without having to try to zoom back to where it is. And you don't even want to shift a map a little bit or you'll have to deal with the labels on that side of the map that got pushed off or pushed on or whatever happened. Use rulers and guides to align. And another big consideration and something we didn't talk about in this was labeling features. That should have gone in the same bullet as symbolizing your features, getting all your features symbolized. You also want to label what you want to label. And you want to be really considerate of fonts. So uh, type fonts are licensed to you. You, don't, uh, you can't just use any of them. With your Windows operating system, you get a bunch. When you install other software, you get more fonts. Like if you only, if you don't have any additional fonts on your computer, 
You've got a standard set of fonts like Arial, Times New Roman, all of those kind of things. But oftentimes, I make maps that have fonts on them from the Adobe Creative Suite. I own Adobe, so I've got all these other fonts I can use. And so I make maps with them on it. And if I were to give one of my maps, the map document and all the data to someone who doesn't have those fonts, when it goes to label everything, it'll substitute a font, and they won't look anything like they did on mine. It'll, it'll, they, it will make the map not as uh, legible. So another consideration. All right. So I think we're going to take a short break and then we'll do a demo. All right.